Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with our April pecan topics. And today we have several really uh, special guests. And so we're going to have some great uh, presentations and I'm excited to see how, how it all works. It's going to be a little bit different. But um, I wanted to, uh, we've got about 40 people signed in right now and it's going to be uh, probably a little over an hour. This is going to be recorded, so if you ask questions, you may be on the recording, but we welcome questions in the chat, or um, you can unmute and ask a question as we go along as well, but we'll try to have time at the end for questions as well. I'll go ahead and start by, let's see, we've got somebody need to, if you could mute yourself while we're going along and then we'll, um, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and share our introduction. All right, can everybody see that all right? All right, so our pecan topics for April. Uh, last year we started our Zoom meetings uh, in May. So next month we will start with kind of an overview, but we're going to change up the topics that we're talking about. Last year in May we talked about zinc and some other things that were important, but we'll try to keep it fresh and add some new things as we go along. But our fact sheet that we've been talking about all along is the calendar for pecan growers, and it's HLA 6200. And if you have um, access to our Oklahoma Pecan webpage, you can find that or you can Google just HLA 6200 or a calendar for pecan growers and it should pop up. But for this month, we um, these are just a list of some of the things that we think pecan growers may be doing at this time or maybe should be doing at this time. And so uh, I know Charlie Graham with the Noble Research Institute, he said he was doing a lot of whip and tongue graphs this past week. For, um, for some research plots, but that's one, one way to do grafting, but not as common as some of the other ways that we're gonna talk about today, such as the bark graft and the four flat graft. And then in our pecan management class, we've been uh, pre-germinating nuts to use for, uh, to grow seedlings. And so that's, this is the time of the year that we would be doing that, planting those seeds in the pots and having our our seedlings started. We like to wait till after the threat of, of a big uh, freeze event, and we're getting close to that time. We also need growers to start thinking about our weed control, or many of you may have already been doing some weed control before right now. Um, and we're gonna have, have that as a topic today. And then uh, Dr. Phil, he's gonna talk about pecan nut case bearer, and that's one of our main insects that we're going to be uh, thinking about getting ready for in the coming weeks. Applying zinc is also one of those, one of those um, management things that we really need to stay on top of, especially for young trees. We need to be applying zinc about every two weeks from when they start to push and we wear a bud break until about the middle of July when they start to slow their growth. At the research station where we had a lot of freeze damage, we're gonna be applying zinc on our mature trees um, pretty often because they're gonna have a flush of a lot of new growth this season. So we wanna keep that zinc on the leaves uh, so they can get the benefit from that. And then we're also gonna be starting to talk about some disease control. And uh, Charlie's gonna, gonna talk about that later in the program. So I just wanted to mention that we are meeting in person for our pecan management class. We have 21 people that are in the class and most of these people are, or all of the people are from our 2020 class that we had to cancel. This is just a couple of pictures from Tuesday's class when we met together and we were talking about, um, in the bottom picture, we had Wesley talk about mesonet tools. And then we were out in the orchard and, and Charlie Graham was talking about some pruning and, and we were talking about bud stages and some other things. So we were, um, it's, it's kind of similar to this Zoom class, but we get a little more in depth on our topics and it's in person. So how do things look across the state? Uh, had some questions already about, you know, what are, what are things looking like 
in the orchards. And we've got um, some pictures. I called or texted some of my friends across the state to send some pictures of, of what some of the, the bud development look like. And it's a little bit um, arranged on this slide um, as you might think of Oklahoma. So this picture up in the top left corner, this is way up around Cheyenne. And this was Lakota. And they're just starting to, um, they're not quite at bud break, but they're, they're really close to losing those scales and, and opening up. But that's a Lakota. And then if we look at the other side of the state in the north, northeastern side of the state, um, we've got, this is a native, it's right here and it's starting to, to pop out a little bit. This is around the, the Pawnee County area. This is a, uh, I believe it's a Pawnee. And so you can see it's a little bit more advanced than maybe uh, the natives. And then we've got, this is at the research station and in Perkins, so kind of the north central part of the state. We've got uh, a Pawnee and it looks pretty, it's pretty out there already. It's not fully expanded. The leaves aren't quite fully developed, but we've got some catkins that are developing. And um, this is a, a Merrimack, which is a little bit slower to break bud, but you can see they're, they're coming out as well. Now, uh, Charlie sent me some pictures. I, I'm thinking they're around the Ardmore area, but this is a Kansa and a Pawnee, and you can see a little bit of difference in how they break bud. Uh, the Pawnee, since it's a the pollen's going to be shed first, those catkins start to develop right away. So sometimes if you're wondering if you have a early or late pollen shed, you can take a look at when those catkins are developing. So this is Pawnee and this one is Kanza. Now down at the bottom, this is a little bit closer to the Red River and we've got, um, we've got a Kanza, a little slower than some of the others maybe, but it might just be the location that they took the picture. This is a, a Pawnee. And then this middle picture, or the, the one in the middle right here, this is a Caddo, so it's out even more advanced. But just a little bit about what things are looking like around different areas, and you may be seeing quite a bit of difference, either slower or faster. So uh, makes a difference in your site, your soil, and, and the varieties that you're growing. Wanted to include uh, just this mention that we have uh, the webpage okpecans.okstate.edu. We have a Graftwood source list, and this is what the, what it looks like. We have two uh, sources, Dick Hoffman and Blaine Kremers, and it lists some of the common uh, gra uh, the common Graftwoods that you might be looking for, what they have, and their pricing, where you can contact them. This webpage also has uh, video resources. It shows. Uh, it has all of our links to our Zoom meetings, and then also has links to videos showing grafting and some other type of, of management. And then we also have links to our fact sheets, and uh, you can look those up uh, for more information to, uh, to go along with. They have uh, detailed pictures and step-by-step -step on how to do things. If you're in Oklahoma or in the central part of the state, Payne County is holding their grafting demonstration on April 29th, and Dick Hoffman will be there uh, doing his presentation on this. It's at 630 at the Payne County Expo Center. Uh, you need to let Keith Reed know uh, that you're going to be attending just so they have enough space uh, available for the event. But his email is right there, or you can contact me later for that information as well. Really excited about the, the, we're being able to have our Oklahoma Pecan Growers Association meeting in person. Uh, registration is now open. The meeting will be at the Stony Creek Conference Center in Broken Arrow, so kind of the, around the Tulsa area. Uh, the meeting is going to be June 10th through the 12th. On the 10th, which is a Thursday, we'll have a kind of a mini pecan class um, on from one to five that day. And so Charlie, uh, Phil, Charles, and myself will be doing that mini pecan program. If you sign up for the, the, the convention, then that's included in, in this um, class. And then the educational program for everyone will be on Friday, all day from eight to five. And then on Saturday, we'll have a field day um, in the morning till right after lunch. It's near Edna, which is kind of close to Bristow, about an hour from Broken Arrow. 
But at the OPGA meeting, we'll have the state pecan show displayed. We'll have a pecan food show that anyone's uh, welcome to enter food in that. It has to have pecans in it though. And then we'll have vendors and equipment there for people to see. Uh, but that link, the Oklahoma Pecan Growers Association page is how you would register online. The upcoming Zooms that we have, uh, the next one will be May 7th, and then we have June 4th and June 9th. And remember, you need to register each month uh, to join in. And then here is my contact information. I know you're getting emails from me, but if you uh, need anything, you're welcome to contact me at, at any time. All right, did um, I think we've got Phil up next on the program. So Dr. Phil, are you ready to share your presentation? <coughs> yes. <coughs> okay, you gotta, <coughs> you gotta enable me. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> there you are. Should be a co host. <clears throat> Can you see anything yet? Yes, just go ahead and do your slide. Yep. Slideshow and you should be good to go. Okay. Can you see oh, it okay? Right. We want to switch, go to display settings and switch oh, yeah. screens. Yep, right there. That one? Okay. Uh -huh. There we go. That's perfect. Okay, pecan insect pests, what to look for. Uh, and we've kind of talked about some of the things that last time we discussed uh, scale insects. And this time I wanted to just touch ever so briefly on uh, pecan phylloxera because I think we talked about it perhaps a little bit uh, the last time, but I wanted to make sure that we uh, we address this because it's it's critical right now. Because as you saw from those slides, some of these pecans are starting to leaf out, and so the time for phylloxera control is when those leaves, when the buds first start to break, to the time when the leaves reach about two inches in length. So. Kind of be aware of that if you've got if you've had this problem in the past. Don't wait until July and say, "Oh, I can take care of this now," because this is when you'll see it. Uh, this is when you'll start to see the symptoms <coughs> and the signs. So take care of it now if you know of the trees that have experienced it. And we talked about some of the uh, various insecticides. Unfortunately, at this time, we really don't have a lot of sort of what I would call user-friendly and safe kinds of insecticides to use. And I would venture to say that a lot of these aren't even grazable if you have cattle grazing in your orchard. So kind of keep that in mind, but it takes thorough coverage. So as a minimum, 100 gallons per acre uh, if you're making those kinds of applications. And that may, <clears throat> depending upon the tree size, <clears throat> that may mean Oh, as much as eight to 10, 15 gallons per tree, you know, to get really thorough coverage. Okay, but it's really based upon gallons per acre is what you should go by. And just get thorough coverage if you're, if you see a necessity, you do not have to treat the entire orchard. Typically, pecan phylloxera does not move a great distance in just one season. So kind of keep that in mind. The other early season pest that I did want to mention after phylloxera, uh, because it occurs generally before case bearer time, and case bearer is going to be our primary focus uh, that we're going to talk about today, is pecan sawfly uh, and its damage. The, this is the sawfly. This is not a caterpillar, even though it looks like a caterpillar. It looks kind of, to me, it looks kind of like a slug more than anything else. Uh, and sometimes the damage from this is relatively light, so you really might not notice very much defoliation in terms of the shot holding damage that it does. They have a tendency to sort of scrape the epidermal tissue off the leaves and really not make too many holes at first, but as, they, as the populations get heavier or greater, uh, you can see the shot holding that you see in that far right picture. Once again, uh, you're, you're pretty much stuck with the traditional insecticides because 
This is not a caterpillar pest. It's not a not one of the uh, Lepidoptera. This is a Hymenoptera, which means a membrane which turns into a wasp. And since it turns into a small little wasp, uh, you cannot control it with things like Confirm or Intrepid or even the uh, the BT products like Javelin. So <clears throat> this is not one that we typically get overly concerned about because it's damage is rather limited, but just be aware that it usually hits about that time after phylloxera time, which is generally the first part of April to the 20th or so of uh, April for phylloxera. And this one hits shortly after that time. So maybe towards the end of April, first part of May. And then jumping ahead into May. Okay, we're getting real close to that time of the year. We worry about pecan nut case bearer. <clears throat> and pecan nut case bearer is definitely, uh, can be a major pest uh, in pecan. I don't think it is what I would consider a primary pest in the northern region of Oklahoma, although we can see, uh, and there are growers that have experienced 75% or more loss from pecan nut case bearer. So kind of keep that in mind as we go along. Uh, if you let the first generation, and we can have as many as three generations of this pest, if you let the first generation have its way with your pecans, because you're, let's say that you are growing a heavily seeded variety, a large seeded variety, and you want to thin it out, it's not a terrible strategy, but you've kind of put the pest in control of the thinning rather than yourself. So what it means is if you look at this lower picture on the left, that's second generation pecan nut case bearer damage. And then you got third generation on the right, lower right, where it only affects one nut perhaps, but you can't bet on that because that nut may be small. So it could exit and affect the entire cluster. Early in the season, it can affect, affect the entire cluster and actually uh, often does and eliminates the entire cluster. Uh, it's maybe not as uh, common for it to move on to additional clusters, but it can. And so <clears throat> this is what we're, this is what we're concerned about to some extent. We're concerned about the adults. And you say, well, I thought the larva was doing the damage and the larva is doing the damage, but the adult is what we're going to be monitoring for. And the, the population of adult males out there is gonna dictate when we have to be out there scouting. So this is what the adult male looks like kind of a, a tiny, maybe three eighths of an inch long uh, moth with this raised set of black scales about one third down the wing covers. Okay, so this is the pecan nut case bear. This is the beast that we're, we're concerned about. And there's that raised set of black scales going across the, the wing covers. Pretty characteristic. And we'll see it in just a moment in, in a trapping uh, situation. This is the larval form. Uh, it can be brownish to greenish, you know, various stages, but the, the damage is really the dead giveaway. In the past, we usually would recommend growers to go out and scout for eggs, looking for the small white eggs, and then flag that individual cluster to come back and see when that egg goes from a whitish color to almost a reddish color, as you see on the right. The problem with this is sort of age related. And I don't mean age related for the case bear, I mean age related for the, the old folks that are trying to see it because I have a hard time finding these eggs. I can find them, uh, but it's a real challenge even with my, even with my Walmart cheaters on, you know? So <clears throat> what I tell growers is at least be out there on a regular basis during the most critical times of the year so that you can spot the damage. So in terms of when to be out there, this is where the trap comes in. And what we recommend, if you've had a problem or you feel like you're going to have a problem with this one, what we recommend is the Farrakhan 6 trap, Roman numeral 6. 
So Ferricon 6 is made by Trace A Incorporated. Trace A is a Oklahoma company. They're uh, located in Adair, Oklahoma. And uh, the business is actually owned by uh, Bill and Donna Lindgren, who are, Bill is an OSU graduate and a, a distinguished alumni of Oklahoma State Entomology and uh, Entomology Department. He was in the entomology department. Now it's entomology and plant pathology. And uh, you could see the, uh, <clears throat> the, on the left, you see the tacky bottom that inserts into that trap is full of these little moths with the dark black raised set of scales on them. In some cases, the moth may be turned over, but you don't see much of anything else. You see a couple of leaf hoppers, a fly, but no other moth species that really resemble this. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, in this particular case, the pheromone is very specific. Now keep in mind that this trap and the sticky bottom is pretty much worthless unless you have the pheromone. And we'll look at the pheromone here in just a moment. So scouting around the end of May, so kind of keep these times in mind, around the end of May, about seven to 10 days after, the, after you capture the first uh, moth is when you'll start scouting for eggs if you want to start looking for eggs. It's a good idea to get out there if, you're, if your eyes or your glasses are capable of it and you examine 10 clusters uh, per tree across several trees. In that process, if you get to 310 clusters checked, now 310 clusters, not 310 nuts. If you get to that point and you haven't found two hits or two uh, clusters with eggs, you do not have to treat, okay? You just have to resample in about three to four days. And uh, what we suggest is if you are out there examining these things regularly, then about six weeks after this first generation, that's when you're gonna see that second generation. Uh, as far as an economic threshold is concerned, it may depend in part on the market that you have and on the varieties that you have and how much of a crop load that you have. Okay. So in, in these two examples that I have, we're looking at one to 2% uh, infested cl clusters for first generation, 2% uh, for second generation and third generation. So we're looking at 40,000 clusters per acre on a variety that maybe yields 2,500 pounds on an on year. Same variety may yield 1,500 pounds on an off year and 60 nuts per pound. And if we look at a 1% infestation, that costs you about anywhere from 400 clusters on an on year to 260 clusters per acre on an off year. So what does that amount? It doesn't sound like very much, especially if you've got a heavy crop. But if you look at it, three damaged nuts per cluster is equal to about 1,200 nuts or 18 pounds on that on year, $32 lost per acre. And on an off year, $23 lost per acre. So legitimately, this is a primary pest and you can't afford to ignore it. And you also can't afford to put it in control of your nut population. Yeah. So the larvae move about for about two days after they start tunneling into the nuts. And this is why I say it's a good time to look for the frass and the webbing around the base of the uh, of the nuts. We'll see a closer up picture of that here in just a moment. But uh, it takes them about two days after you capture that first moth. So first generation can destroy a whole cluster. Subsequent generations may just take one or two nuts, but still you saw the effects of that damage. The total days of capture uh, are uh, from capture of first male moth to damage is anywhere from 12 to 16 days after first capture. So the way we look at that is you have four days to make that decision. There's three to four generations per year and they're about 42 to 45 days apart. So here's early pecan nut case bearer damage. And you could see that frass or the bug excrement. So frass does happen. 
And in this case, it happens on those at the base of those clusters, okay, right where they started to come out. And in this case of this lower right hand picture, you could see it's going to affect every single nut in that cluster. It's going to take the entire cluster out. And this is the lure that we're talking about. So you, the critical part about that trap is to make sure you put the lure in the bot, the sticky bottom. That is what attracts those male moths to that trap. If you don't have the lure in there, it doesn't, there's no pheromone. There's no pheromone or hormone to attract those males. And we see sort of a close up uh, here in this picture of the, the dark raised scales. And like I said before, you can even tell after a while, it's very specific trap, a very specific pheromone. If you have a large moth, obviously it's not a case bearer. If you have a, a really tiny, tiny moth, it's obviously not a case bearer. The only one that we can confuse this with from time to time are the bud moths. And bud moths have a tendency to come out very early and they kind of have a zigzag triangular little pattern on their wings. They don't have this one single ridge of dark scales. <clears throat> okay, so if you need the traps, or if you want to uh, experiment with the traps and see if you have a problem with this thing, uh, this is the time, this is the uh, location that we have, the Trace Incorporated location in Adair, Oklahoma. You can call their cu customer service line or contact them via email. And you wanna get these traps <clears throat> ordered this month, if at all possible, if you're gonna be trapping for them. We suggest that, <clears throat> we suggest that you set them out anywhere from May 1 to May 10, that's very early, but it's critical that we have some zero days of capture. We want, we want to have maybe as many as a week's worth of zero captures, because that's a true indication that they're not active yet. And it's also a true indication when we get our first capture that that may, and I say may, indeed be the first capture. So monitor the traps regularly every day if possible. And once you capture moths on two consecutive days, the moth flight has begun. And so here's what I mean by <clears throat> capturing over two consecutive days. Three different uh, orchards. These are just examples, three different orchards. And if you look, we caught something in every orchard on May 16th. But you'll notice in the case of orchard number two, we caught nothing on May 17th and 18th. Therefore, May 16th is not our biofix. We're looking for that biofix, that first sustained moth capture. So we'd have to go and say that May 19th was our biofix. So from that point on, or that point forward, we're looking for 12 to 14 days after that biofix. So in the case of orchard number one, our biofix is indeed May 16th. In the case of orchard number two, our biofix is May 19th. And in the case of orchard number three, our biofix is May 18th because we, we had a zero capture. Even though we caught three one night, we had zeros the next night. We had a zero the next night. So kind of keep that in mind. What we suggest is 10 days after that biofix, that might be a good time to be out there looking for eggs if you're so inclined. But 13 days after biofix is when we expect to see 25% of the eggs deposited. So begin, we suggest that you begin scouting at that time, 13 days after biofix. Within that 12 to 16 day window is when you're gonna make that decision to treat or not to treat. And we've got a fact sheet on it, EPP 7189, can tell you more. Uh, every three days, do you look for eggs or you look for damage? Uh, if you reach two infested clusters, we talked about that in, before you check 310 clusters in your treat. Treatment is not always warranted, like I said, but scout carefully each time and go back for that second generation. Second generation can be very, very important especially if you have not treated for first generation. And a lot of growers just routinely treat for uh, first generation, whether they need to or not. I don't necessarily advise that, but it's not a bad scenario if you think about it from what, another perspective. 
And that other perspective is uh, for webworm control. So if you're using something that has an IGR like Confirm or Intrepid or Troubadour or Turnstile, one of those uh, IGR products, or you're using a BT formulation, uh, the nice thing about coming in there and, uh, well, especially with the IGRs, if you're coming in there with an IGR, an insect growth regulator, and you're mixing it with a spreader sticker, it has an incredible residual, usually up to about 21 days. So it's a good opportunity to take advantage of that, and it will carry you through the webworm season. So if you look at some of these larger uh, commercial growers that have uh, maybe hundreds or thousands of acres of pecans, they're putting it out on a timely basis, and they're going to control not only case bear, but they're going to get enough residual activity in terms of controlling webworm problems. And those growers don't have problems with webworms. <clears throat> so apply gentle, uh, something gentle on the beneficials. And we, we generally suggest uh, something like Intrepid or Confirm, but I said there's uh, several generic products out there that have the same active ingredient as Intrepid, like uh, Troubadour and Turnstile. Uh, I believe there's another one on the name escapes me for the time being, but there are some generic products out there that contain methoxyphenicide, which is the active ingredient in Intrepid. If you're an organic grower, you can go with Javelin or Dipel, probably be your cheapest bet would be the Javelin uh, if you can find it. And then uh, Intrust is another uh, type of organic product that you can use. There's some other products like uh, Spinosad that does, that does an excellent job uh, and Intrust is the organic formulation of Spinosad. The nice thing about the Spinosad products, like uh, um, like Intrust, is that it actually kills eggs too. So if ovicidal, so if it's if your timing is not perfect and maybe it's a little early, you sh it should be effective at killing the eggs as well as the larvae. But and the residual is decent. It's not as great as the Confirm or Intrepid. And there's a lot of other choices out there, but, are, but most of those other choices are the conventional types of insecticides that are not very gentle on beneficials. Okay, so next time, we're gonna, I'm going to stop right here. Like it says, stop. <laughs> and we're going to, next time, we'll cover the mid-season pests uh, next month. So if you if you have questions about case bearer or any of those other things I've mentioned, by all means, you can ask them at this time. <clears throat> I have a question for Phil. You're welcome to put them in the chat or you can unmute and ask your question. I stopped sharing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't see any questions for you, Phil. Oh man, I just covered the whole waterfront. You were just water you good. <laughs> you good. How'd I do on time? Uh, you're about 20 minutes. Hey, that's what you said, 15 All to 20. Right. Okay. So we, um, our next speaker is going to be Jimmy Carroll. And um, uh, we share the same name, last name because we are married. And if you've been at the research station, you've probably seen Jimmy uh, he does all the maintenance. Uh, he does all of the uh, the management there at the station. So I'm going to go ahead and and help him uh, share his screen, and we'll we'll get started. Share your screen right here. What? Is that it? Okay, can everybody hear me? I think you're good. All right. So uh, my name is Jimmy Carroll, like you said, I take care of the research station. I've been there for about 30 years. So we'll get on with it here. Just get it. Is it gonna go for you? experiencing technical difficulties right now. 
Bear with us. Let me see if I can get this to work. It's not advancing for him. So let's try it again. All right. Okay. So why we apply herbicide? Uh, the bottom line is, is on small trees, we're going to try to uh, get into business pretty quick as we can, because that's our uh, that's where our goal is to get started on in uh, bearing. Okay. So uh, weed control is number one on a, an important scale on growing young trees. Uh, the uh, it increases the tree growth. Um, the weeds compete for moisture and nutrients, okay? So uh, weeds can be allelopathic and inhibit the growth of trees. So have you ever seen a weed patch and that's the only weed that's growing there? Like a patch of mare's tail? Well, it's inhibited the growth of other weeds. So it does the same on trees, it's trying to inhibit the growth of that tree. So, uh, and one other thing in the fall, it aids in mechanical harvest. If you've got a uh, complete flat orchard floor where your strip is, it's much easier to blow. Either you're using a leaf blower by hand or you're using a mechanical blower, it's much easier if there's nothing to hang up on that weed. Of course you mow, but there is still a little bit of weed sticking up after you mow. So it, it aids in mechanical harvest. Okay, when to apply a herbicide. Right now at Perkins, I'm gonna hold off. Uh, I'm a little bit late due to the ice storm damage, but the weeds are actually stressing right now. It is really getting dry at Perkins. We had an inch and three quarters about three weeks ago, and that didn't go very far. So the weeds are in a, in a stressed condition. So we wouldn't want to uh, apply herbicides and the weeds are in stress condition because they won't take out the post-emergence. Now your pre-emergence, you're still gonna, uh, you're gonna squelch your, your seed germinations, but you wanna get the stuff that's uh, post-emerge. Okay, uh, prior to your fertilizer application would be ideal to get your weeds killed down because your weeds are actually taking in your fertilizer and using your fertilizer up to commit for your trees. Okay, uh, we want to get that pre-merge down before the summer weeds emerge. At Perkins, about May 15th, pigweed and mare's tail are our number one weed, and they start coming out about May 15th. So you want to have your pre-merge down before that. Uh, you need to look at your weed size. The, the, main, the main thing that the people make a mistake on is they wait till a weed gets two foot high. You're not going to kill it. So on most every herbicide label, there is a, a growth, growth level that you uh, apply when the weeds are a certain stage to be able to get the optimum kill. And that's what you need to pay attention to. Uh, pre-emerge, if we get a three inches of rain, call for three inches of rain, I'm not gonna put my pre-emerge down before three inch rain comes. In sandy soils that, such as Perkins, it leaches, okay, we get a very, bad leaching problem with, with the soil of very little organic matter in there. Uh, most pre-emerged need from a quarter to a half inch of moisture to be able to bind to the soil particles. Once again, the soil particles are key to getting that pre-emerged to work. So the sandier soils are not gonna have the binding capabilities of a clay soil. You, you may be able to get a beautiful uh, pre-emerge uh, herbicide application on clay soils and sand, it's it's constantly, you, you have to keep that pre-emerge there through the leaching. Uh, Post-emergent application, there's probably, in, you're looking at to keep a really good free strip in our soil, uh, depending on the rains, depending on how much rain you get, how much you irrigate, you're going to have multiple applications needed. So probably four, four in a season, a post-emergence, glyphosate. Uh, watch for heat. I don't ever spray herbicides when it's over 95 degrees because what happens is is, is the uh, transpiration, whenever you put that on the plant, it evaporates, okay? The wind and the evaporation 
and you just don't get a good uptake of the plant absorbing that into the root system. Okay, uh, the label also must have, it might have label recommendations. All right, what to spray. So we need to eat, identify our weed problem first, see what we have that our problem weed is that we're trying to kill. And whether it's annual or perennial or, or it's a grass or a broadleaf is what you're gonna spray. Uh, I, I tend to look at whenever you're spraying weeds, you look, look at what that's gonna cost you per acre. And your bottom line is you wanna get off as cheap as possible and be able to kill the weeds. So call, call around to your local ag supplier and get several different prices of the herbicide that you have in mind, what your target weed is going to be. So uh, price per acre is bottom line. So you could have a small little uh, jug of say X herbicide and it would be in a powder and that may be $300, but you're only gonna use two ounces of that powder on that weed. So in general, it, it, it would, it would be cheaper than spraying prowl and do a better job. So look at the price per acre. So divide, divide that little jug up and see how many acres that's gonna do. All right, uh, there's multiple approaches of pre and post emergence. I always use a pre-emergence and a post-emergence for the first three sprays, okay? You look at the tree, tree age restriction on that label and see what, what age your trees are. So like uh, one or two or three year old trees are gonna be different of what you can use. The more, uh, like, like a one year herbicide is going to be more expensive, probably it's gonna be more expensive than some of the other herbicides, okay? Uh, soil classification. Once again, we talked about the loamy soils and clay soils. Some labels have a soil classification that you look at to see if you don't have so much uh, percentage of organic matter that you can't use that. Uh, runoff potential. If you have runoff and goes in a non-target area, you can also damage other crops. Pre-harvest interval. The pre-harvest interval is the, the amount of time before you can harvest once you apply the herbicide. And it's very important to pay attention to this because you may have an unmarked crop of pecans and that only you say you only you would know it but if there was something happened with your pecans say somebody got sick or there was a question about it they're going to come back and look at your pesticide records and see what you spray and it is a violation of the law federal law to to not adhere to that rule once again, I mentioned cost per acre. That's what you want, want to look at, cost per acre, not volume of, of uh, herbicide in a, in a uh, jug or can. You want to look at cost per acre. Okay, let's say how to apply, all right? Calibration is the key because one, it's going to cost you uh, more if you're not calibrated correctly. You're not going to get a Weed, the weed is not going to be controlled if you're not putting enough out and it is a violation of the law if you're putting too much or too little on. Uh, equipment to, to apply. What about May, last month's, do what? Last month's Zoom. Oh, uh, Dr. Uh, John, John Long. Long talked about calibration. And if you have any calibration question, I didn't watch the Zoom, but I hear it's very good and very, uh, very easy to understand the way he told the calibration for you on your herbicide calibration. Okay, equipment to apply. All right, you can use the fixed boom, which I use a boom with nozzles on it. Uh, you can use a, a handgun, and a handgun can be calibrated as long as you have a stop on the lever that you're putting the same amount out at every time at a certain speed. You can uh, have a, a shielded sprayer or some people use a boom buster. I don't like a boom buster. Boom buster is a, is a nozzle that sticks out and it's got a coarse nozzle and a fine nozzle. I don't like that for putting on pre-emerge herbicide. It's like uh, using a shotgun when I could use a rifle. So it's more precise using those uh, nozzles on that boom, okay? Drift of herbicide is any off target herbicide application. 
So if that drift, if that goes to your neighbor's place, that is off target. If it goes on the leaves of your newly planted pecan tree, that is off target. That is not where you want it. You want it on the ground or on the grass or the weeds that you're trying to kill. Okay, it's a very good idea to have grow tubes on your young trees because any bark that is thin, which the bark is not scaly or dead, is you're gonna soak up herbicide in that green bark and it's very easy to kill a young tree. Younger the tree, the easier it is to kill. Okay, applying an orchard. Uh, three or four applications of post-emergent and pre-emergent. So most of the time you're gonna put out the first, I usually put out the first three sprays of pre-emerge. That's due to our soil type once again, it's, and it may not be the situation in your orchard or your place that you're spraying. You have clay soils, you're gonna get by with, with less on the pre-emergent, okay? But I use either a glyphosate, glyphosate or there, there's some new ones out that we'll talk a minute about that on the post-emergent. Uh, soil type rainfall, weed pressure will dictate the number of applications needed. Once again, if you get a lot of rain in the summer, summer and you irrigate a lot, you're going to need to put on more herbicides. Rotate the active ingredients to avoid resistance. This is very important. Uh, No-till has created monster weeds. Uh, it started in the north where they did a lot of no-till. And a lot of that is not using enough of the active ingredient of the herbicide to kill the weed. So we've created, we've created resistant weeds. At Perkins, we have mare's tail and pigweed that's resistant. So if you don't put enough herbicide on and you just weaken that weed and it bears seed in several generations, that becomes, uh, becomes resistant to herbicides. So you have to change your formulation of herbicides. Use maximum rate label on reeds like, uh, like we said to, to avoid creating resistant weeds. Don't go over the maximum number of sprays or amount of active ingredient per season. So once again, follow the label. Okay, here's an example of what we did in uh, 2020. Uh, what I've I've used all different uh, herbicides, some of the new ones that came up, the new formulations, and I can't tell a whole lot of difference. So I, I do it a little bit different. I use cheaper chemicals, but I use the full label rate. So April 20th, I put on two quarts of simazine and two quarts of uh, glyphosate. Okay. Simazine to pre-emerge. Do what? Simazine to pre-emerge. Simazine to pre-emerge, okay, it's old, Cheap pre-emerge, all right? So May 20, I'm going with two quarts of diuron and that comes in a powder or a liquid and two ounces of AIM for our resistant weeds and 1.5 quarts of glyphosate, okay? So there's my first three sprays, okay? June 25th, I put on another two quarts of simazine. What do you say, is that a lot? Well, I think that is the label rate per season. I'm putting on a full label rate, but I'm spitting, I'm splitting it up. Like what we said about is the rain and the leaching. Okay. So I can always have some there. So if we get that three inch rain, well, another month, I'm putting more, uh, more herbicide on more um, pre-emerge. Okay. So July 27th, I put on two quarts of glyphosate. I've got everything going my way. We've been through the May 15th, the weed emergence of my trouble weed, which is mare's tail and pigweed. One pigweed plant, if you let it escape, thousands of seeds. That's what we're trying to, to uh, capture. Okay, September 1st, I'm getting ready to start almost mowing for harvest and all that. So I'm putting on two quarts of a glyphosate and one pint of embed. And last year I did the row metals to kill the kill the pigweed in the row metals actually in the grass. So that, that helps out a lot. But the embed is a 2,4-D derivative that's brand new 
and it has no volatilization. It's less. Less. Volatilization. Less but volatilization. Now, I feel completely safe about using this. And this will take care of your existent weed problem if you use it when the weeds are small. Now, grant you another weed is two foot tall, you're not going to do any good with it. You got to use it when the when it, the weed size recommendation on the label. Jimmy, we had a question in the chat. Someone asked about um, are these rates per acre? Yes, those those are all the rates per acre. So you've calibrated your herbicide uh, applicant or your sprayer, and you know exactly how much liquid, how much water is being applied to an acre, and you add uh, that amount to for each yes for each acre based on the amount of water you have in your tank is how many acres you could do so my i'm calibrated at 15 gallons an acre on the rig that i'm using so some so that's another point that some pre-emerge herbicides suggest how much water you should use per acre to get that on the soil and get it in there right so that's another point 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 to pay attention to Okay, so native grow weed management. You guys have got cattle out there. Uh, you're managing two crops, essentially. You're managing the cattle and you're managing, uh, you're managing the uh, pecans. So there's certain things you can't graze out there in the pesticide world, okay? You reduce the competition for moisture if you can get rid of your weeds. You still have your grass under those trees, but I understand that you have to make a dual profit. Um, you reduce disease pressure if you can keep that that can that the weeds down low and keep the airflow in that orchard. You can actually uh, reduce the di disease pressure if you can keep some airflow in there. Uh, ease of harvest, as far as the uh, you know, if you have Big old blood weed, which giant ragweed in your in there that that uh, hurts on your harvest, and you you can keep that down. Also, if you take hay from underneath your trees, you can get, get a better hay crop off of that. Uh, cover crops, cover crops. If you get your cover crop thick enough, say it's clover, you can actually choke some weeds out. So uh, once again, look at the grazing label and pay close attention to that. Okay, native grow herbicide options. Okay, Weed R64 is, is a good one uh, that you can use. Um, I'll tell you a little story about 24D. One time I went to a grower's orchard that uh, is, was Eastern Oklahoma, and uh, me and uh, the other person I was with rolled up in the orchard and we smelled 24D. And we go, uh, did you smell, did you spray some 2,4-D? He goes, yeah, I sprayed 2,4-D ester to kill my clover. Well, it was in a day in June when it was really sticky and hot. And he had done that that morning and by the, by we were there right after lunch and you'd always already see the, the trees wilting. So he lost that year's crop. So in bed, like I said, it's a 2,4-D derivative and it's, it's a, uh, very safe as far as I can see. But once again, pay attention to the label. And uh, so uh, it's just it's just an improvement. Weed R64 is also has 240, but the embed is just has a little bit better uh, reduction in that uh, that volatility. So in those conditions you were talking about, it would be a little bit better. But it's also labeled for other crops as well. And um, and it's it's kind of a new formulation. Pay, pay close attention to that pre-harvest interval of sixty days there on that uh, embed. So, all right. Often your success or failure depends on your skill and what's in your toolbox. So, first of all, one thing you need to get is your private applicator slides. Don't don't uh, rely on your dad to bootleg and buy you pesticides or, or your neighbor, all right? So uh, we control failure. Uh, like I said, it's, you have to pay attention to that label and the size of the weed, okay? 
damage of trees and other plants or organisms, all right? You can damage your trees if you overload with pre-emerge or you have drift off target to your young trees or your old trees, okay? Safety is the applicator's responsibility. You are a responsible one with that license. Read the label. Do not rely on your egg supplier to tell you what to put down. Or how. Or how. For instance, I was working on, I used to take care of an orchard over by Guthrie, and there was this fellow that, that he, he started taking care of it the year that I quit taking care of it, and he put down uh, Hive RX. Well, Hive RX is a soil sterile. It's used only on gravel and barnyards that uh, you're trying to keep the weeds out from your equipment. Has really no agricultural plant purposes other than to nuke the weeds. Well, fortunately, he didn't put enough down, but he put it down in strips, in his pecan trees, and it didn't kill him. But if he would have put down enough, it would. It would he would have wiped him out. Okay, so you are the person reading the label and you need to pay attention to it. Okay, keep records. Keep your wind speed, your air temperature and rainfall after you've treated an amount applied because if your neighbor certainly, if he comes up and says, I've got damage on my roses and I believe you did it. Well, you have your records against his statement that you can come up with and uh, you can show him those records and that would that would help hold up a lot if you were to, be, to get in trouble on that. And it also helps you to know what worked and what didn't so you can change it up the following season. Right, and how much it cost and, and what you did. I mean, it's just a good idea to keep records. Okay, so there's very good resources in the OSU uh, extension. Uh, current report. Current report, Noble Foundation. Very good stuff in there. Uh, Kelly Solutions. If you have a, a uh, if you want to read a label without buying it or without going and looking actually on the jug, go to Kelly Solutions on the internet and look. And that's what I do all the time is I look on the label and read the label. It's up close before I go apply something. I have it on a computer screen. It's up close. I don't have to get my glasses so I can uh, read that and 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 know more about it. Okay. Few rules remember you can calibrate sprayer, control perennial weeds prior to planting. So, if you're going to plant an orchard, you need to start uh, controlling the weeds through glyphosate, uh, disking, smoothing. Use your proper PPE for what the label says. Have directed herbicide sprayer. Only spray with no, with low or no winds. Use cultural methods to avoid moving weed seed. If you have a, a bat wing or a mower, an eight foot mower, and you go out and mow your pasture, see this is a picture of weeds right here in the herbicide strip. Well, what's gonna to happen to that seed? It's gonna go on your mower. All of a sudden you drag your skid in your herbicide strip while you're mowing the middles, then you just planted your weeds back in there. So keep, keep that uh, mower deck completely cleaned off of weed seed and you'll have a lot better luck at keeping your problem weeds out of there. Rotate your mode of action where we talked about the 2,4-D derivatives and glyphosate and AIM. There's another one. There's AIM and a few others out there. Store pesticides correctly. You want to keep them from freezing, keep them away from uh, pets, children. Uh, protect the environment. Pay attention to that label and runoff and all the things that are connected with that. All right, that's all I have. Quick sharing now. All right, so we had a couple of questions. Um, yeah, stop sharing. So we had a couple of questions. Um, someone asked, do you have specific pre-emergent materials you would recommend? And, and you talked a little bit about that simazine and diuron or a couple, but there's many other ones. And if you take a look at either that current report, the 6242, or the, uh, the Noble Foundation, they have some recommendations on there as well. And then Phil also mentioned that the cdms.net, I believe, uh, is also a good uh, 
web page to look at labels and uh, get, you know, before you go to the store, you can take a look and see what, what they say on those labels. So any other questions for Jimmy? All right. Well, we will go ahead and move along. And right now I want to introduce the Hoffman crew. Um, we've got uh, Dick Hoffman and we have Chris and Shane and they are with Hoffman Pecan Farm uh, just east of Stillwater. And Dick is one of our uh, longtime pecan growers. He's in the association mm -hmm. and his family, they collect graftwood and, and sell graftwood and also do some uh, grafting uh, for other people as well. But they're going to do a little presentation on on how to do grafting and I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, to Chris and Shane and Dick. Yeah, uh, I'll do it. We got to get this screen up. How do I share my screen? Are you ready? Yeah. If you um, you should be okay right now. We can see Dick and we can see. Okay. Can everybody see him all right? It's coming through on my screen. Yeah, I can see you fine. Okay. I'm Shane Hoffman. Um, my grandpa, Dick, and my dad, Chris. We're going to go through a little tutorial on a bark graft. Um, start out with uh, some of the equipment that you that you need and some of the important things um, that goes along with it. Um, we uh, use sandwich bags, just regular open-ended um, sandwich bags, um, aluminum foil, regular plain aluminum foil, um, small 18 gauge nails. I don't know if you can see all of this stuff on here. Um, a pair of nippers, uh, small tack hammer. You're going to need a fairly sharp knife, a roll of masking tape, and some rubber bands. Um, and then once the graft is on, we seal everything with aluminum foil. Yeah, and a good bow saw to, to cut your tree. Some of the you know more important things that, that you're going to need is Practice. Don't try and practice in the field on this because your graft probably isn't going to grow. So if you're new to it and, and want to put some grass on, cut you a limb off and and uh, practice on your back porch or uh, wherever's comfortable and and make some of the cuts and and work on putting it together uh, before you get out there and, and try it. Time in the field is um, pretty critical. The longer that that graft is out and exposed to the air the less chances you have at making a, a good graft that's going to grow. Um, I'm going to let him talk to you a little bit about the graft and show you how to do it. Good afternoon. 55 years ago, next month, I put the first graft on our farm here in Payne County. And I put on quite a few cents in. <laughs> As a... Uh, Becky mentioned earlier in the program, Keith Reed, our extension uh, horticulturist from Payne County, has scheduled a grafting workshop at the fairgrounds October, uh, April the 29th. It'll be at 6.30, it's free to the public. And I'll be uh, presenting the uh, demonstration. We'll do a bark and a pork life graft at that demonstration and answering a few questions. To be successful at grafting, we have to have a good healthy tree. Uh, we have to have grafting wood that has been cut and uh, prepared while the graft wood is still dormant. I have a sample here of a bundle that I put together. This particular variety is Great King. It's an old, old variety that uh, Dr. O.S. Gray from Texas had uh, named several years ago. We will uh, Generally package our wood in about uh, 12, 13 inch long sticks. 
I wrap my uh, wood in a very lightly dampened newspaper because I think it helps to protect the buds on the uh, grass wood and keep them from being broken off. Trying to find a tree that's uh, dormant and uh, out of dormancy enough for the bark to be slipping is a little bit difficult on the 9th of April. So this is actually a limb from a Pawnee tree. Uh, one of the flaws I might say with the Pawnee is it breaks bud a little earlier than most other varieties. So it makes it a little more susceptible to a late freeze damage like we had in 2020 about the middle of April, a lot of the Pawnees were, were eliminated because of that tree. Uh, one thing about the Canva that we really like is the fact that it doesn't come out of dormancy quite as early and uh, we've seen less damage with the Canva. All trees break uh, buds, uh, you know, break uh, dormancy at a different schedule. So normally we, we consider in Tame County, a per perfect grafting time from around the 1st of May till about the 10th of uh, June. And by all trees not breaking at the same time, we may go out on the 1st of May and find a tree that's still not, not slipping good enough. So the best thing to do is just walk past that tree and not even attempt it and go back in a week or two later because like I say, they all come out of dormancy at a little different schedule. The tree that uh, we, this limb that we selected is gonna be about between an inch and a half and two inches in diameter where we are gonna cut it off. If you're running cattle or to protect the tree more from deer, we like to do the graft at least five or six feet off of the ground. And another thing that it really helps is the bark is generally tougher on a native a tree that's grown from a seedling. So when you do the shaking in August to do the nut thinning, we notice that there's a lot less damage on the trunk if it's not been grafted down at the ground level. Okay, we're gonna select a, a piece of wood here. And uh, normally a good piece of grafting wood, we want it about six inches long. And uh, we prefer to have two sets of buds on the graft above where we put it on the tree. You want to remove it. Yeah. All right. Now we we select the place on the tree where we're going to cut the tree off. And if this tree is as much as three to four inches in diameter, you want to make sure and cut it from both sides so we don't uh, strip the bark down the tree and uh, mess it up. The bow saw that we like to use is called a Balco. Uh, they're a little hard to find, but they're one of the best bow saws that's available. And uh, it, uh, it really does a good job cutting. We, we try to use some of the best tools that's available, and that's one that we prefer. They make regular grafting knives. I prefer my butt knife. I've been using one for over 50 years, and, and I got used to it, so I, I prefer it. One of the things that we want to do, especially on a tree that's three or four inches in down, is that the bark is going to be a little thicker and we can thin it down slightly and make a, a little, prepare a little better place to uh, make our pattern cut. And if I can turn this a little bit, see the bark is fairly thick on a tree, a limb this size. So if we, Shave this off a little bit, it makes it a little better to prepare a place to put our graft. We want to make our pattern cut about two inches in long, and uh, it wants to be as flat as you can get it. I always turn it over and shape the backside to where it's going to be a little sharper. 
And then I like to scrape a little bit of the edge of the, the graft, and we don't want to touch the cut surfaces. Uh, Dick, this is Becky. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, someone asked what brand of bow saw did you say? They didn't hear that. Oh. What, what brand of bow saw? It's a ball cove. Uh, it's called the Hall Cove. It's made in Sweden and they are probably the best uh, 21 inch uh, bow saws available. Where do you uh, Walmart that? Nursery, I know, in De Leon, Texas, uh, has them, and that's where we generally get ours. But there's, I, they're a little harder to find, but uh, it's one of the best cutting saws that you can use. One of the things that causes failure sometimes in grafting with being too articulate and taking too much time before you get the graft back in the tree. Once we get it all prepared to make the pattern cut, we want to get it back in the tree as quickly as possible. And uh, I, I like to make two pattern cuts about an inch down the sides and getting a good tight fit here where we get the cambium in contact with the cambium. Once I've made those two cuts, I like to take my knife and make a cut through the bark right in the middle just below it. that, and if this bark will slip now, <laughs> trying to get one to slip in April, the knife is a little bit more of a challenge. And let's see here. Normally you can take the tip of your blade, and this is still a little tight, so that's why we want to wait till the first of May. Once we get it, Started, we can. I like to hold some pressure there and bring the graph down. We want to leave about a quarter of an inch of exposed cut surface on the back. This helps our healing process around the top of the tree. Uh, we want to use from one to about a four inch tree. And one of the reasons we don't want to go much bigger than that, it takes about one year for each inch of trunk diameter. So a four inch tree will take about four inches to cover the top over. And this will help to prevent from rotting of the tree. We can either secure this two different ways. Uh, anything that's this small, sometimes I will use just masking tape to secure it. We'll go ahead and nail this one. Uh, and I take a, about a half to three quarters of an inch of that flap on it. It's not important because it's going to die anyway. We use a small hammer so that we don't damage the bark. And I just use one nail. Kind of tell the difference of the sound when it gets flush, you want to stop. And this will keep the grass in place until it uh, heals in. Aluminum foil has a shiny side and a duller side. We want to use the shiny side out. And we'll cover the grass. Then by pinching the corner out of our Baggy, and we'll pull it down over the graft, and we'll secure the top of the rubber band. I like to use a night, number 19, and uh, this will deteriorate with the sunshine in about three to four weeks and break. And if it doesn't, we want to go back and check it to make sure it does because it'll dirt the tree. It can girt that graft a little bit there and make it more susceptible to breaking. When I first started grafting 55 years ago, we used string to secure the bottom of the plastic bag. Birds tend to build nests about this time of the year, and they like to use that string for part of their nest. So we'd go back in a week or two, and that string would be gone. But the masking tape is quicker, and it holds it in place 
quite well. One of the other things, and I, I need a, would you cut me a bird torch, torch off for that? One of the things that we want to do once we get the, uh, the graft on is uh, the last step, we, we use a shellac called amber shellac. You can find it at Lowe's and we cut a whole graft with the shellac, but them all. This helps to hold the moisture in the graft until it peels into the tree. And uh, birds tend to like to light on a, on a graft and have you put them on. And we've seen several knocked out that way. So we like to put what we call a bird perch on the graft after we get it to pet. And you can attach it also with the mask to take. You want to make at least five or six grafts because that way it'll hold it securely on. Some people use it one by one by two. Our bamboo rods or anything like that that will extend above the glass. And another thing that we've noticed over the years that the sap tends to go to the highest part of the tree. So if we've got a limb that's quite a bit higher than the, the graft is, we want to remove that part of the tree so that it doesn't. Consuming too much of the sap that's coming up from the root system to keep this graft going. I've seen several grafts that started and then quit because they weren't getting a good supply of sap up from the roots. Okay, like I said, we, we did put these on from May 1 to about the 10th of June. And we want to go back in about two to three months. We're going to have a lot of new growth that's coming out on the trunk. If you have a limb or two below the graft, this helps to feed the tree until the graft, and it keeps the graft from growing too rapidly and making it more susceptible to being uh, blown out or breaking off. This, this one will heal the top over in, in about two years, it'll be completely healed in. And uh, we should get nut production within three to four three to four years off of the Pawnee. And as Becky showed earlier, we're already seeing the catkins forming on this Pawnee, and uh, that's a good sign that the, the tree will be setting nuts on the, uh, that's about it. And uh, is there any questions? Does anyone have a question? Okay, uh, Steve posted, uh, sometimes my bark graft works at the bottom, but it doesn't take at the top. As a result, it doesn't grow around the top of the native tree. How can I fix this on the grafted trees? What should I do to improve my technique for future grafting? So I guess it heals over the bottom, but not at the top. Can you- The buds come out from the bottom? He said oh, that the lower it, graft, you mean? He said that the 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 graft is healing at the bottom of the graft, but not at the top. Uh, you have when you have two sets of buds, you actually have eight buds that can grow. Any one of those eight buds can grow. If you knock off the primary bud, there's a secondary, then there's a third bud, and then a fourth bud. And uh, as long as just one bud breaks out and grows, that's all that's necessary. We want to avoid doing very much pruning on the, on the graft the first year because it's trying to re-grow re, uh, the, the amount of uh, wood that the, we've taken off of the tree. But if you have a bad crotch or you want to try to train it to the central leader in, in a pecan, we want one, one particular one to be the the leader and then our side branches want to come out at a good angle where we don't have a sharp angle that can break out pretty easily. I, I think the problem that the person is having is he's putting his cut surface below his graft. So it's healing, but his cut surface is below where he cut it off with his bow saw. So it's not growing over the top. I think that's what his problem is. Yeah, I 
think so. You understand? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's going back to just making sure that that you have the, you know, half an inch or so of your graft being just slightly above the, the cut part of the tree. I'm going to pull this apart so you can have a better look at the cuts that we made on the, the graft here. Um, I'm going to take this off. So having your, your buds point upwards and not downwards is going to be um, important. And then having this small cut area on your graft wood be just above the, the cut of your tree so that it will heal around the top of the tree as it grows. Yeah, that, that will help with, with that callus development there at the top, I would think, too. So. Um, I had someone else ask, uh, is grafting better than just planting a tree or is this just for a stronger tree? So maybe we should start by saying why we graft, Dick. Why do we graft? Mm -hmm. Any nut that you plant um, is going to yeah. grow back as a native pecan and not a paper shell. So you can take any paper shell pecan you want, plant it in the ground. It's going to grow as a native um, smaller, harder shell pecan um, to get the paper shell pecan that we want on the on that rootstock. We have to use a graft wood from the paper shell pecan variety that we want. Some of the uh, selected varieties that we have available today, like the Merrimax, was a planted paper shell, but it's it's very rare when it turns out to be an exceptional nut. Uh, if you planted 100 uh, Saponi nuts, every one would grow up and make a different uh, nut when they pr start producing. So in order to get one that's identical to the Pawnee tree, you have to take the wood off of a Pawnee tree. Those, the ones with the native uh, American names like Pawnee and Mohawk and Wichita have been developed in a breeding program in, in Texas, at back in Bryan, Texas, and they do this by cross-pollination, and then they plant the nut. The Choctaw and the Mohawk had the same two uh, crosses, which was success and mayhem, to make the Choctaw and make the Mohawk, but they're quite differently in when they ripen and the shape of the nut and everything. So every nut that comes up is different. That's why we have to graft it. The first successful graft was done in the mid 1800s by uh, a black slave by the name of Antone and how he was able to take wood that wasn't dormant and make it grow was kind of a mystery <laughs> because it's very hard to do. The wood needs to be dormant uh, for, for a successful graft unless you do what we call a patch bud and you can do a patch bud off of wood the same time that the the tree is uh, actively growing and a lot of the nurseries do those in August. They'll get the wood off of current growth or, or a year old growth and, and it, the bark has to be slipping. So they, they take the bud off and put it on the tree and tape it. And a lot of times they won't force that one if they do it in August until the next spring when it uh, comes out of dormancy. Yeah, other questions? The four flap graft is used at the same time and we, we won't be demonstrating it today, but I will be at the fairgrounds on the 29th. And it's primarily used for trees that's about half inch diameter up to just under an inch. Anything an inch and above can be done with this type of graft here, the, the bark graft. And uh, so it primarily replaced the what we call the whip graft that they used to use. The whip graft has to be done when the tree is still dormant and your window is a lot smaller for it and it, it doesn't have the success really that the four flap or the banana graft does. Any other questions? That looks like you're good, Dick. Uh, 
Becky had to step out. They had a fire alarm happen at the station, and so oh, no. she had to go running out the door. So she asked me if once you finish up, if I'd go ahead and share my screen and start the, the disease. But uh, no, excellent job. And uh, I guess we do have one other question. Someone wrote at the bottom that says, if I graphed a 10-year-old tree, I think they meant when does productivity start? When's it going to start producing cones on a 10-year-old tree? Mm -hmm. A 10-year-old tree, if they graft a 10-year-old tree, how long before it starts to produce the cons? Uh, if, if you put a graft on a seedling tree. 10-year-old tree. A 10-year-old tree that uh, comes from a nursery should be already making the cones. No. And if, if you graft a tree that's uh, four inches in diameter, we've actually seen nuts the second year and, and most normally the third year will, will be the first uh, uh, time that you'll see nut production. Uh, most of the uh, improved varieties uh, come into production a lot quicker than if you leave a tree a native. A native tree, if you just left it a native, sometimes can be 15 or 20 years old before it leaves and produce nuts. And that's the reason for grafting. You get a, a thinner shell for con that shells out a percentage of anywhere from 50 to 60 percent, and a native. You can only expect to get about 40% uh, of uh, nut made out of the uh, native pecans. A lot harder to crack, a lot harder to, to uh, run them through the uh, shelling process where the paper shells have a lot thinner shell and uh, much easier to, uh, to crack and, and uh, process. Periodicity. Not sure what uh, uh, what what you're meaning by periodicity. Well, that, that's the question I just asked you about productivity. Is what they were saying. Right. Really? I, I don't. I'm not sure what periodicity would be either. Productivity is a significant amount of productivity is going to be seven to eight years. All right. Um, yeah, unless um, you want to chime in and, and let us know, but I'm not real sure what uh, what periodicity um, you're you're referring to uh, so as far as production. Yeah, within a couple of years you'll have nuts um, from the new graft. Um, seven to ten years for significant um, nut production. Um, but uh, other than that, we'll. We'll turn it over to you, Charles, and let you. Yep, sounds sounds good. Like I say, good job. And uh, if there are any more questions, we'll catch up on it after we finish up here. Uh, so you can quit sharing your screen, and I'll go ahead and share mine. And, Uh, I think we got everything going now. That's good. Looking good. Okay. Yeah, Becky will probably join us in a moment once they clear up what's going on with the fire alarm. But I'm uh, I'm Charlie Graham with the Noble Research Institute, and I'm just going to go very quickly through some disease stuff. I know we're running a little bit long. We've already had to have a few people leave, but uh, we'll whip through this right quick. Uh, well, this is your native range that you're typically going to find uh, native pecans growing from you know Texas up through Missouri. Uh, and the reason I show you this is just to say that, you know, because we are the native range where pecans originated in North America, we probably have all the diseases that you could find on a pecan as you head east or west from here. Those diseases may not be around at all, and then we'll have to deal with those. But uh, we're right in the middle of the native area. Uh, pecan scab, of course, is, is going to be, like I say, your... Um, most widespread and overall destructive disease that we face on pecan. And we generally arrange our fungicide programs strictly based on scab. And if you do a good job on scab, you'll control most other diseases that you're gonna have on pecan. Uh, like I say, scab is the ma major limiting factor in pecan production. Um, the thing about scab is, is all deals with moisture. Uh, and so you're not gonna have a scab outbreak. It takes about generally 10 to 12 hours of leaf wetness or, or mo moisture on the shuck for the 
spore to have time to germinate and actually grow in and infect that leaf or nut. Uh, so that's the reason we were talking about earlier in the early talks with Jimmy, where he's talking about keeping the uh, orchard floor mowed down or with herbicides, you have better airflow. The sooner we can dry moisture off the leaves and the nuts, the better chance we're going to have from not having a scab episode occur. Uh, of course, it can you know happen on any part of the tree, leaves, twigs, shucks. Um, you know, if you look at leaf scab, leaf scab is, is bad because it reduces photosynthesis because every place you have a lesion on the leaf, it can't make food. Uh, of course, it, if it's really bad, you can defoliate the tree. And even worse is it serves as a source of inoculum surrounding all those nut clusters that we're trying to protect as well. Uh, once the actual nut gets uh, infected, you're going to have reduced size as far as the nuts themselves. You, if it's really severe, you can have nut drop. And if it's fairly severe, you'll have a reduction in the amount of kernel you have in each variety. When we look at pecan fungicides, um, they need to be applied at a regular basis. Uh, in other words, what we try to do, it's, it's like a prophylactic. It needs to be on the leaves or on the fruit before a rain event occurs to protect it. You know, we don't want to let the rain event occur and get an infection and then to come back after the fact and try to remove that disease or kill that disease after it's already established in the leaves and the, the shuck. So it's really important in your spray schedule to watch your weather. And we're trying to apply our fungicides before we have a wetting event or a rain event occurring to keep the spores from germinating and infecting the plant. Uh, here we see infection on the leaves. This is very early in the season. If you look in the very center part of the picture, that's a nut cluster. I and mean, we're right after pollination. So this is really early in the season. Uh, this occurred probably in late April, early May. Uh, so you can have infections that are very significant very early in the season if you don't take care of the trees and you have a lot of wetting. In mean, this particular month, we had almost 20 inches of rain in the month. And so it's very difficult to keep fungicides on. And so you can have major outbreaks. As far as uh, shuck disease, this is a typical cluster you're going to see. You can see the scab lesions on the shuck itself. When we look at how much infection we can have, uh, if you look at the top row there, that amount of scab infection is generally not going to have a big impact on your quality and your nut size. When you move to the bottom row, when we start seeing you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of the shuck covered with scab lesions, that is going to definitely have an economic impact on the quality and size of your nuts. And of course, the bottom right picture, when they all turn completely covered with scab, those nuts will abort before they ever try to fill. Uh, so it can be quite devastating. You can lose the entire crop if you don't take care of it. What makes it so difficult to control? Of course, first one's weather. That's unpredictable. Uh, I mean, you're going along, we may have no rain in a month, we may have 20 inches of rain in a month, and it's hard to predict. And, and so you just have to kind of watch the best you can. And if you know you're going to have a major rain event coming in and you haven't sprayed in two or three weeks, go ahead and get a spray on before that rain event occurs. And of course, one of the big problems we have is our choice of cultivars. Um, you know, if you're going to try and protect a cultivar, if you're not going to spray, you have to choose the most resistant cultivars that you can. If you have the ability to spray, you can grow some more susceptible cultivars, but you still have to be sure you do a good job of keeping the fungicide sprayed on those cultivars to keep them clean. Uh, a big issue we have, I mentioned earlier with the tight orchards, if you let the trees crowd too much, you reduce airflow through the orchard and you don't get the leaf drying that you want to have. If you let your weeds get up, you know, chest high, three or four feet tall, I've been in orchards where the Johnson grass was into the low limbs on the trees. And in that situation, you just have no airflow through the orchard and humidity stays very high and you have a, you use a bigger problem trying to control scab. Um, another reason we have issues with scab is poor spray coverage. Uh, this is just where people decide that they need to drive too fast. You know, I've been in orchards where I, they have issues with scab in the tops of the trees. And it's like, well, how fast were you driving when you put the front side on? It's like, oh, we're doing about six or seven miles an hour because we need to get the orchard done in just a few hours. And generally when you drive that quickly with an air blast sprayer, the mist goes up into the air and then you just cut the top off of it because you're driving too fast. So you need to get your tractor speeds down to more in the two, two and a half mile an hour range if you're going to get good coverage on bigger trees. Or else you're going to be cutting your spray plume off at the top. Uh, and then the final issue we have in some orchards that have overused the same chemical over and over and over again, we can have some resistance to some of those fungicides. And so we have some isolates, just like Jimmy talked about with the weeds where they sprayed 
Clive said over and over again, you got resistant weeds. We can do the same thing with scab pathogens where we spray the same chemical and over and over and you get pathogens that are actually resistant to that particular chemistry. Uh, another disease you will see on occasion, especially in young trees when you're not doing fungicide sprays is brown spot. Uh, these usually are just a, a brown spot infection. It'll be reddish brown in the beginning and sometimes you'll get some shot hole out of it. Uh, here's an example on some pecan leaves on the right. You can see the splotches that you have. Of course, up in the trees, it'll look more like this. Um, and so this disease can be quite devastating if it's not controlled. Uh, brown spot, once it's established, can completely defoliate a pecan tree. Uh, and then it has to put a whole new set of leaves out in August. And there goes next year's crop because you put all your energy for next year's crop into putting new leaves on this year. Uh, here's some trees. You can see how you can see right through these leaves. They've already shed so many leaves. The few leaves you see there are bright green. That's new leaves coming on the tree where you defoliate the entire tree. Uh, when you look at, you know, there's your nuts, but where's the leaves that are feeding those nuts? They're on the ground down there. You can see the, how all the leaves are piled up under the trees. Uh, so it can be quite devastating, but generally if you do a good job with scab, you won't have any brown spot problems. Um, like so we just talked about the defoliation and everything. There is another disease, uh, pneumonia leaf spot, which looks very similar and they'll both do about the same amount of damage. But like I say, scab can, good scab sprays will control both of those. A uh, new one that we've seen more recently, Neofusicacum, we didn't see this disease till about 2012. And then we saw it in multiple states, Texas, Louisiana, Georgia was the first one that did a report on it. Uh, it's also one of those diseases which can be uh, quite widespread and seems to be much more prevalent now than it used to be. And once again, like brown spot and pneumonia leaf spot, it causes major defoliation. This is an Elliott tree. You can see it's lost a good portion of its leaves. So Elliott's very scab resistant, but it's not resistant to Neofusicacum. So if you're not spraying for scab, then you have Neofusicacum issues. Uh, a common thing you'll see with it, it kills the entire leaf instead of a bunch of leaflets on the ground. You see how all the leaflets are still attached to the compound leaf. And even, you know, it starts to kill at the tip and work its way back. But when the leaves fall out of the trees, they'll just pile up and you see the entire leaf laying on the ground. The rake is still there and all the leaflets attached to it. And that's a fairly common symptom that you'll see. So it makes it a little easier to identify. A number of fungicides work on it well. The typical ones you're going to use in the orchard, the abounds, the enables, the DMIs, uh, you know, your last, your dodines, all those will do a good job controlling it. So I, as I said, you know, a good job of scab, you control the fusicacum as well. Bacterial leaf scorch, we'll see in a number of orchards. This is pretty much widespread from Western United States to Eastern United States. It's caused by Zyella fastidiosa. Um, once this disease infects your trees, uh, it's there for life. We can't get rid of it. Uh, fungicides will do nothing to help control it. Uh, it's a bacteria and once it's in the tree, it can be a major problem. Uh, as you can see, you get the scorching effect in the leaves and you'll have those start to fall off as well. Often the rachises will stay there and all the leaflets will fall off. Um, so it can have a, a pretty good impact on the trees. Um, if you look at the impact it has on production, uh, over a three year period, we looked at Cape Fear trees uh, and you know, we had an average of 58% defoliation on the affected limbs. And with that, you had 11.7% decrease in your in shell weight of the pecans as well as almost 16 percent kernel loss uh, so it can be quite devastating on, on certain varieties but we've looked at a, a number of different varieties all of these are susceptible so so far we really haven't found anything that's resistant to zyella uh, there's a number of other varieties we still need to test but all everything that's been tested so far will be infected you will see a little bit of difference in how they react. In other words, probably the worst I've seen is Cape Fear. Pawnee can be pretty bad at times as well. Uh, but Cape Fear, you can have major defoliation issues with that. In fact, they've pretty much quit planting Cape Fear, and especially in South Louisiana, because they just have such issues with it down there. Powdery mildew is one you'll see quite often. It's pretty easy to recognize powdery mildew in the orchard. Uh, of course, it's a microsporella uh, fungal disease. That's typically what you're going to see in the early part of infection. All the nuts will turn white. And I know everyone's probably seen this in their orchards. Uh, once you get later on in the season, the top nut uh, was sawed white way back in the spring. But when you get to fall, it turns to a tan color. 
Generally, we don't see a large impact due to powdery mildew. Uh, I mean, we've done a number of different tests on it. There is some differences between varieties. On the left, you can see you know, your Caddo's and Kiowa's, Moreland, Sumner's, those were pretty tolerant to powdery mildew, whereas when you get to the other side, Desirable and the Kono and the Coney, those can be quite susceptible uh, to powdery mildew. Um, but it's a very sporadic disease. It'll be bad one year. You may not hardly see it the next year. It just all depends on the weather conditions and how much inoculum is out there. So it's not one of those we ever really worry too much about having to spray for. And generally your uh, scab sprays will take control of it as well. We do see a little bit of difference as far as what will control it. Here's a typical grouping of pecan fungicides that can be used. If you look by trade names, I mean, here's what that would be, your agritins and ables and stuff. Um, when you look at what will control powdery mildew, just those in red. So looking at your DMIs and your uh, zoxystrobilurins and stuff like that, those do a really good job of controlling it, but you like your agritins and stuff don't do near the job or phosphites don't do near a good of a job on powdery mildew. Bunch disease is one we'll see across uh, the United States in a lot of different locations. Uh, it, it's actually, you can see this is, has been a good bit of bunch in the entire tree. The top left limb up there looks a little bit normal, but most of it's pretty bunchy. What happens is it looks like a witch's broom. All the inner nodes get very, very short. So all the leaves are piled on top of each other. And so it's very dense canopy you see in the trees. Uh, it's a phytoplasm. Uh, once again, once it's in the tree, it's pretty much in the tree and you're not going to get rid of it. It's in the group with the prunus X diseases. Uh, of course, been around a long time. 1932 is first recognized. Up to that time, they kind of confused it with zinc rosette. Uh, but once they started spraying zinc, they realized those trees still didn't come out of the rosette, even by spraying zinc on them. And so they realized they had another issue and it was finally identified as the phytoplasm. Uh, like I could say you get these abnormal dense bunches of, of, of shoots and growths of leaves. Uh, if you look in this tree here, the bottom left, you can see how bunchy the foliage is where the top right hasn't become infected yet. Another common characteristic and good time to look for it is in the very early part of the spring, like right now. Typically you'll see infected bunch trees will have the leaves come out about a week ahead of a normal tree or healthy tree. So if you go out in the orchard and you see one tree that all the leaves are coming out on, it looks pretty dense on the leaves and everything, good chance it has bunch and then the other trees will come out at a normal regular time and have a lot more uh, longer inner nodes and everything. So you can kind of see both in this photograph Bunch on the left, normal tree on the right. As far as our susceptibility, I mean, really susceptible varieties, I mean, Desirable, Elliot, Mayhan, Schley. Uh, you do have some resistance that is out there. Um, so one thing we really try to avoid, you know, Dick was just talking about grafting trees. You don't want to go collect your cyan wood from, from bunch infected trees. I mean, every, I've been in orchards where they grafted and top worked some young trees and you'd come across about one every 10 or 11 trees would have bunch already. It'll show up very, very quickly when the grafts start growing out. Uh, so try to collect your cyan wood off of uh, non-disease trees. Um, if you see only one limb having it, you can often cut that limb off and you may have saved the tree. It infects on a, li a limb and works its way back to the tree. But once it gets back to the trunk, it kind of spreads throughout the entire tree. But if you catch it early, you can cut some of it out and have some success. Some other diseases we won't talk about today, but uh, can be important if you're not spraying for scab. Of course, anthracnose, vein spot, leaf blotch. We talked about pneumonia leaf spot a little bit when we did brown spot and of course downy spot. Uh, most important thing I'll just tell you, know your orchard. I mean, it's your orchard. You should know more about it than anybody else. So you should know, you know, what your cultivars are, how susceptible they are to scab. You know, if you had an issue or in certain sites of your orchard that has problems with other diseases, low spots, things like that. And of course, a really important is to know is, you know how long it takes you to put application of fungicide out. So, you know, if you're looking ahead and you see you're gonna have a rain event and you don't have enough time to spray your entire orchard, Spray the hot spots first. The cultivars you know are going to have an issue, desirable, things like that, and leave your more resistant varieties off if you can't get the whole orchard done. But you know how long it takes you, so you know how quickly you need to start spraying to cover your whole orchard before a rain event occurs. Things you can do that are not chemical for disease control. We talked about you can thin your trees out to get better airflow if you're getting too crowded. Do some limb prunings to open the trees up to get a little more airflow and sunlight into trees themselves. Uh, hedging will help out with that if you want to uh, or have someone close to you that can come hedge the trees for you and course selecting your scab resistant varieties. 
as far as some of those, because we did have this question earlier, uh, you know, excellent resistance, Elliot, Kansas, Lakota have been tested and look really good. Recommended for trial. The reason I recommend for trial is they've shown excellent scab resistance, but I haven't seen enough Avalon growing in this area to know how well it's going to perform in the Midwest. Uh, I mean, we've got an orchard that's being put in uh, that's going to have probably over a thousand trees of it, but it'll be a number of years before we really see how well its resistance holds up. So those are recommended for trial. And when you drop down to your mediocre stuff, your conies, caddos, moorlands, you're going to have to have a spray program with those in most areas. I get this question a lot, so I threw it in at the end here. Uh, do I need to put a fungicide out if I don't have a crop? And even if you don't have a crop on pecan trees and Phil will back this up on the insects, there's still certain things you've got to control whether you've got a crop or not. You know, if you have an outbreak of black aphids or scorch mites, or if you're not spraying fungicides, you can have major defoliation, which will cost you next year's crop. Uh, so generally we'll spray early in the season to protect the trees early. And often by the time you get to, you know, first of June, mid June, if you don't have a crop, often by then you've protected enough of the foliage that you can let things go and you'll probably be okay, but still have to monitor your insects just in case you have a, a black aphid outbreak or something like that. You don't always have diseases when you see symptoms. This is just to show you, you can have insect diseases. That's black aphid on the top left, you know, stink bug on the bottom left, case bear you saw earlier, scorch mites on the bottom right. It may not be insects, it can be herbicide damage. Uh, and you can see glyphosate damage on the top left, Q4D on the bottom left, you know, diuron on the bottom right. So, I mean, you can have herbicide, which may mimic a disease, but it's either the herbicide or you can have insects, which will mimic the disease symptom as well. So you need to identify what your problem is where you can treat it. Uh, just just a, a quick spray schedule that I often send to a number of people just to get an idea. Uh, I think I want to point out on there, and Jimmy had talked about earlier when he talked about herbicides, and, and it's true for fungicides and, and insecticides as well, is that you have to look at cost per acre. Uh, you can't just look at how much you're putting out. I'll have people like, for instance, with seven, uh, takes three quarts per acre. Or if you're spraying a fungicide, if you're using phosphites, the top rate's three quarts per acre, whereas you're using something else, it's only three or four ounces per acre. So you got to look at the rate and determine just what the cost is going to be per application per acre and not just go by the volume of chemical you're having to put out. Okay, so check that for sure. And the other thing is rotate chemistries. That's reason, another reason I showed this spray schedule. If you notice, I'm doing group 11, group 3, group 30. So I'm rotating through different chemistries to try and prevent any disease um, um, resistance from building up. So if you're rotating your chemistries, you won't have a problem with that. If I go in, you know, we had a really great fungicide years ago in the 70s, been late, but it got sprayed sometimes 10 times a year. And we only had it around for a few years and they had to take it off the market because it developed resistance so quickly. It, it, you're just spraying water out there when you put been laid out. So we lost a very good one because we oversprayed it. And so that's what we're trying to keep from happening is rotate chemistry to keep from losing chemicals that we have right now. And that wraps it up. I did it pretty quick because I knew it went over for a little bit. Hey, Charlie, I'm back from my fire alarm event okay. here. I hope, hope y'all are, are made it okay and all the buildings are still fine. And Yeah, we get numerous uh, numerous fire alarms that are, they have to, they make everybody leave and stand outside until it's safe to go back in. Uh, there was a couple of questions in the chat. I wanted you to see if you would address uh, Melissa asks, do you spray every rain event or every couple of weeks and try and coordinate it before the event? Uh, no, you don't have to spray before every rain event. You do have some residual. It stays on the trees. So, so typically I'm spraying about every three weeks. Now, if I'm two weeks out, you know, I've sprayed two weeks ago and I'm going to have a rain event. And it looks like it's going to be, uh, you know, a several day rain event. I will go ahead and spray at that point. But if not, I'll go ahead and wait the full three weeks. Uh, before I put an application on, but that's roughly that schedule I showed you is spraying about every three weeks and usually I can get by with about six sprays a year uh, on most years. Only if it's really wet will I have to shorten that up and that's the reason there's actually eight sprays on that list I showed instead of in case you've got to go that extra spray or two because you have to shorten that cycle up a little bit. But in midsummer, if it's really dry, you know, I've gone four weeks, five weeks and if, we're, if you're not getting any rain, there's no leaf wetness whatsoever. You're not going to have a scab outbreak, and so you, know, you can buy a little time and you know postpone for another week and just watch your weather, and then make that application when you need to for that next rain event. There, there's also the uh, Mesonet uh, Scab Advisor. 
um, that you can kind of utilize. You know, you don't follow it exactly if your conditions are a little bit different in your orchard, but it gives you a place to, to start. And you can put in how susceptible your trees are to scab. Uh, it doesn't cover some of the other diseases that you were talking about, but it, it talks about uh, pecan scab. Uh, and we may have Wes come on and talk about that at some point. Uh, another person asked, uh, is it possible to grow pecans without all the chemicals? I mean, you can grow pecans and lots of, lots of native pecans are grown without any chemicals. Um, you just have to realize you're probably gonna have some crop loss either due to weevil or other insects, or you may have on a dry year, you may have a very little scab infection. On a really wet year, you may have a lot. And so you can grow without the insecticides and fungicides, but you just have to realize that year in, year out, you're not gonna be consistently producing pecans. You're gonna have some bad years in there where you can lose the entire crop. So, I mean, that is definitely a new possibility. I mean, organic farmers are using organic fungicides and, and insecticides and, and their production will go down a little bit compared to most other orchards, but they will still produce a good crop. Um, so, I mean, it can be done. I see another question on there. If I have a 30 year old Western and want to change it to a more scare resistant cultivar like Kansas, can I graft? Yes, you can top work trees. Um, you know, if you've got something super susceptible and you're tired of spraying it, you can top work that tree over to something that has better resistance. Uh, so that's definitely something that you can do. And, and just like I and Dick talked about earlier, generally after you put a graft on, you know, three years after you get the graft on, generally you're going to have a few nuts start to show up. But as they talked about, you're probably talking eight or 10 years out before you really get heavy production coming out of that tree. Uh, but for sure you can top work. It's a long process, uh, depending on the size of the limbs, you're limited to you may have to put 20 grafts in one tree if it's a really big tree to top work it over. If it's a smaller tree, you can get by with two or three. Um, so it's just going to matter on the tree size, but you can top work. The only areas I've seen where top working didn't work that well was if you were having instances with bacterial leaf scorch. Uh, we had orchards of Cape Fear down in South Louisiana that had really bad uh, leaf scorch from bacterial leaf scorch. They top worked them to another variety, but the scorching was just as bad on the new variety because you have to realize you've got a section there that still is Cape Fear. And so it's gonna have all that reaction going on with the bacteria. And so we still saw scorching even though we had top worked the trees. And so in that situation, it didn't help us any. We had to go ahead and take the whole trees out. All right, any other questions? I know we could talk about ways to prevent uh, scab and some other problems, uh, doing some cultural things, but we'll save that for another day. Um, any other questions on anything of the, any of the topics that we covered today? All right, well, I appreciate everyone tuning in. I apologize for going long today, but I think it was really great information. Our next Zoom is, is May 7th, and I'll be sending out uh, registration links for that uh, a little bit later. And um, I wanna thank the Hoffmans and Charlie and Phil and Jimmy for helping out today. I appreciate all of their expertise. And um, if you have questions for any of the speakers today, you're welcome to contact me and I can get you in touch with them as well. So uh, thanks again and um, take care. Have a good weekend and I'll see you in May. Thanks everybody. Thanks Becky. Bye. Thank you Becky. Thanks Phil. See you later. You bet.